I hereby call the meeting of the Brockton City Council Finance Committee for Tuesday, September 8, 2020, 7 p.m. to order. Good evening, everybody. Before we um, start our meeting this evening, I would like to take a moment of silence for Sergeant Elder Fernandez, who passed away last month in Texas. The city of Brockton, with his family and friends, honored him this past week and weekend with a prayer vigil and a somber celebration of his life. We prayed for his family, we prayed for his eternal rest, and we prayed for justice. So please join me um, in a moment of silence for Sergeant Elder Fernandez. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Fernandez family. May he rest in eternal peace. Amen. 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 Counselors, um, Councillor Cruz and Councillor Monaghan both contacted me before tonight's meeting. Uh, Councillor Monaghan is not feeling well and will not be able to join us this evening. And Councillor Cruz is on vacation. So, thank you. Madam Clerk, we're going to um, start with our agenda, please ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Endicott Street, extending from Court Street northerly to Leahy Street, Leahy Road, a distance of about 598 feet, more or less, and for that purpose it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and layout as a public street or way of said city of Brockton, invited Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW. Time having arrived, I declare this hearing open. Is there anyone here in favor? Please come forward and state your name. Good evening, Good evening Commissioner. Um, Lawrence Rowley, DBW Commissioner. We have no objections for this request. Great. Um, I know that we have some residents here. Councillor Lally, do you have any questions? or? You know I have something to say, Madam President. Um, I just want to say, you know, this is uh, the first public hearings or, or making roads uh, public that we've had this term. Uh, COVID really slowed everything down uh, for the counselors who've been here. It is, you know, same as the, as the rest of them, uh, the, the new counselors. Uh, the folks on these streets pay the same taxes, fees, and bills as everyone else in the city of Brockton. They're currently not receiving the same treatment. Uh, their roads are considered private ways. Um, this just makes them public. There's no money attached. There's no timetable attached. All this does is make these roads eligible to be paved so someone in the future can get that done. Uh, this is about being proactive and, and making sure these people have the, uh, the same rights and they're on the same playing field as everyone else. Uh, so I ask for your support on items one and two. Thank you, Madam uh, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, is there anyone else here in favor? If so, please come forward and state your name. If not, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Is there anyone here in opposition? If so, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. No one's here in opposition. Therefore, I declare that portion of the hearing closed. Okay. Councilors, any questions? No? Okay. Um, right now, uh, we're voting on um, granting. Questions on granting? No, we're going making this um, road public. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion's granted. Thank you. Did you have, I know there were some residents here from, um, from Endicott Street. Did anybody have any questions or anything? No? Very good. Thank you. Council Alley answered them for you. Perfect. Madam Clerk, number two. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Royal Road, extending from Endicott Street to, to east of Alibi Road, a distance of about 2,533 feet, more or less, and for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton. Invited Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW. Time having arrived, I declare this hearing open. Is there anyone here in favor? If so, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Raleigh, DBW Commissioner, and we have no objections for this request. Thank you, Commissioner. Councilor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just supplement what I said earlier. Uh, Royal, Roslyn, Regent, Leahy, Endicott, and Alibi are some of the 
uh, you know, in, in terms of the roads I represent, they, they are in the, arguably the worst condition. Uh, there are, you know, uh, a couple of, couple of other streets that I could, I could lump onto that, but in terms of one concentrated neighborhood, they, uh, they rank pretty high up there. Uh, so I am happy to see that uh, we are, you know, preparing what will probably be a future council, but nonetheless preparing uh, somebody to help rectify the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else here in favor? If so, please come forward and state your name. If not, I declare that portion of the hearing closed. Is there anyone here in opposition? Please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Anyone here in opposition? If not, I declare that portion of the hearing closed. The questions on granting, all those in favor? Uh, Madam Chair, may I ask a, just a question course, to you? Uh, yes. Since we're, and I'll defer to uh, Councilor Ian Erie, who's been around longer than I have, but since we're sitting as the Finance Committee, I know these are public hearings, but can we in fact approve these tonight or are we not recommending them favorably to the council on Monday where a formal vote would be taken? And I'm comfortable either way. Sure. I just want well, to make I sure the we whole did process this. started in this, these are hearings that were done in, with, in the finance. I believe as hearings, we vote on them in, right. in this committee. But then they have to go back to the full city council. This will go back. The full city council. Right. Recommendation. Right. But we're voting on them as a hearing. Yeah. So yeah. they will end up on the agenda, but we're voting as. So, so we're not approving them. We're recommending them favorably. Am I correct? Uh, back to the floor. Madam Chair. Right. Councilor. Uh, through you to Councilor Farwell, uh, the Councilor raises a very excellent point. I don't want anything to be, to be uh, held up due to some uh, mishap. Uh, at the conclusion of this item, I will motion to take these collectively and recommend them favorably just okay. to be safe. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries favorably back to the full council. Madam Council Chair, Lally. I'd move that we take items one and two collectively and recommend them favorably to the full city council. Motion's been made. Second. And properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Council Lally. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, number three. Ordered transfer of $808,250 from DPW Sewer Division, Sewer Connection Fee for $250,000 and DPW Water Division, Water Connection Fee for $558,250 to DPW Sewer Division, Capital Projects for $250,000 and DPW Water Division, Capital Product Pro Projects for $558,250. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, and Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW. Good evening, Commissioner. Councilors, good evening again. Councilors, this, this money is going to be used to rebuild the culvert on West Elm Street. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of it, where, where my, one of my trucks went into the culvert. This culvert is an easement that runs through Manning Towers on West Elm Street. So that has to be rebuilt. And there's about 115, 115 uh, linear feet of um, the, the roof itself has to be replaced. The sides and the floor, the integrity of them is in good shape. So um, this has to get done right now. We have just a hole there covered with plates. So I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Councillor Thompson. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Just Quickly, is the $808,250, is that expected to cover the full cost of uh, repair of the culvert? That, that the whole cost is for that culvert repair, yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ian Airy. Commissioner, how are you? Good, Councilor, how are you? Just a question. Um, obviously, we're, we're working on that right now, am I correct? Is that, is that what you're... That's what you're Just doing. two different projects there. We're working on the street part right now. Okay. And as we were repairing, or we were re replacing, we were trying to get the sewer main out of that culvert Our that doctor. is being replaced now. That's where the truck went into the hole. Okay. So we're going to get the street done now, and then we'll move into the parking lot area. O um, okay. The street probably another two or three weeks. Okay. All and right. then we'll go right into the parking so, lot. So when we do the other part, it's not going to affect the street part. We'll no, be it's back not. to regular no. flow of traffic. 
Right. Okay. I, I want to make sure that get open, that, that, that street is open before we start the parking lot here. There could be some minor detours a little bit in the gutter line, but um, traffic minor. will be flowing. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you, Madam President. Carlson Castro. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Alley. Thanks for being here. You and I exchanged messages last night about this because I was wondering what are we spending this on, but you're saying that it's all going toward that repair, which is huge and very important, I know. Correct. Um, I'm just interested to know, what are the water connection fees? That is the, the premium assessment fee that we charge, um, $1,500 for like a one-inch service, a new service to go into a new building, new house. I, I believe, and Troy can help me out with this, but this fund was set up years ago by Jay Condon. Yes. And um, so all, all our fees go into that, except for the, the water bills, that, you know, except for those. And what do you know, what is the current balance of the water connection fee account? Troy can help me with that. Okay. It's okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the Council, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. To answer the, the Councilor's question and to reiterate what Commissioner Rowley said, both uh, the water and sewer fee accounts were set up, as he mentioned many years ago, uh, precisely for this purpose, so that when major repairs were needed, there would be a source of funding for them. So net of these two transfers, once the, should the transfers be approved, uh, there'll be a balance of $246,524 uh, in the sewer account and $526,196 in the water account. Uh, so there's still sufficient monies. We did use a portion, if you recall, we did use a portion of funds from these accounts uh, for this year's operating budget because of some issues with some uh, financing and carry forwards from past budgets. But uh, I, I am comfortable uh, recommending these amounts because it does leave a sufficient balance and as you know and in, in future years with the additional revenues from the user fees we'll begin to wean the enterprises off of use of the retained earnings for operating purposes and I anticipate beginning to uh, create much more significant reserves in these enterprises. Okay um, and so I'm wondering what is the capital projects fund? How did how under what circumstances are funds added to that account? So, so that's actually just uh, an accounting term. And so what um, in the past money was appropriated for capital purposes within the operating budget. This is really just uh, a, a way to account for the money. So when you appropriate this money, it comes out of the operating budget, the annual budget. Uh, it's, on June 30th, should this project not be done, by putting it in a capital fund, it allows the project to continue and the money doesn't flow back to free cash. So I didn't have a chance to look at the budget before coming here. Are capital projects, is that a line item in the budget? No, so a, a, again, taking the money here and transferring into a capital fund is an accounting tool so oh. that the money oh. stays in that project for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Sure. All set, Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions, Councilors? I'll entertain a motion. Move to recommend favorably. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full City Council. Madam Clerk, number four. Ordered. Transfer of $32,000 from Metropolitan Area Planning Council to City of Brockton Emergency Management Area Planning Council. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Stephen Hook, Director of Brockton Emergency Management Agency. Mr. Clarkson. Madam Chairman, uh, I bring greetings from the Mayor. As he noted to you in an email, he is chairing the school committee tonight. Uh, but on his behalf, I'm happy to answer any questions. This was a grant from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council through the Bar Foundation that they're offering to many municipalities uh, to uh, enhance cooling activities in the city. Obviously, they made the grant available later in the season. 
but our work under the grant continues. Uh, BEMA Director Steve Hook and I, uh, Paul Umano from my office, Janice Fitzgerald, uh, uh, Dr. Mondesor, our new uh, Board of Health agent, and others have been collaborating to come up with strategies uh, to increase access to cooling activities, whether that's vests that uh, folks can wear with cooling agents in them or water or physical changes, the purchase of fans uh, uh, or other ways to just increase uh, people's access to, uh, to cool air at, at, during the warm weather months. There is no match required. There is none. Move to send back to the full but, city council. Uh, before the motion, Council Lally, did you want you to make your amendment or is it on this item that, correct? I had, so to, to provide uh, maybe a global uh, a address of that, I had, uh, we realized when the orders came out of the clerk's office that several of these grant acceptances uh, were listed on your agenda as transfers. And so uh, we would just provided language suggesting that uh, if you would not mind making an amendment uh, mm. this evening so that the language is changed to reflect that it's a grant. So I did provide some language to the chair and to the sponsoring counselors suggesting uh, those changes. Madam Chair. Council Lally. I'd like to amend the motion so uh, the total uh, Total motion says 32,000 uh, planning council grant to amend the order to state that the following names, sum B and the same is hereby acceptance and expenditure of the grant award in the amount of $32,000. Second. A motion has been made on the accepting the amendment and properly seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? Thank you. All those opposed? Now. Motions on the order is amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? The order carries favorably back to the full city council as amended. Madam Clerk, number five. Ordered transfer of $6,000 from Old Colony Elder Services to Brockton Council on Aging. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Janice Fitzgerald, Director, Council on Aging. Good evening, counselors. Good evening, Jonas. Um, this is a grant coming from Old Colony Elder Services, um, funds from the CARES Act, and the funds can be used to service older adults that reduce isolation, promote healthy community living, address the needs of older adults living in the community, and to help with some senior center costs um, for maintenance and operations, and there is no match. Thank you. Councilors, any questions? Yes, no. Councilor Fowler? Yeah, I, this is for Mr. Clarkson, and I know Councilor Monaghan is sick tonight. Uh, Councilor uh, Rodriguez is going to make the motion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As with the previous item, I, I move to amend the order to state the following names. Some be in the, in the same is hereby acceptance and expenditure of the grant in the amount of $6,000. Second. Second. A motion has been made to accept the amendment and properly seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? The amendment carries. Now the... Um, we're voting on the order as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? The order uh, carries favorably back to the full city council as amended. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number six. Ordered transfer of $269,712.04 from Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, State 911, Fiscal Year 20, State 911 Training Grant to Brockton Police Department, Fiscal Year 20, State 911 Training Grant Fund, invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel Gomes, Chief of Police. Madam Chairman, Chief Gomes is here tonight, as well as Michelle St. James from the Police Department, who uh, can answer any questions on the details of the grant. I did provide uh, you with a brief overview uh, in an email yesterday, but we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Any questions, counselors? Oh. 
Councillor Farwell, you have an amend you Yes, I would I would move to amend the order so that it reads that the the uh, a grant in the amount of two hundred sixty nine thousand seven hundred and twelve dollars and four cents is accepted and transferred to the police department FY twenty state nine one one training grant fund. Second. A motion has been made to accept the amendment and properly seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? The amendment carries. Um, the motion is uh, now on the order as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? The order uh, carries favorably back to the full city council as amended. That was easy, Chief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michelle, for being oh, here. Uh, Madam Clerk, number, we're at number seven, correct? Ordered transfer of $5,000 from Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, EOPP, EOPSS Office of Grants and Research, Highway Safety Division, Fiscal Year 2020, Traffic Enforcement Grant Program, Summer Impaired Driving Grant, to Brockton Police Department, Fiscal Year 2020, Traffic Enforcement Grant Program, Summer Impaired Driving Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel Gomes, Chief of Police, Captain John Hallisey, Traffic Commission. Good evening again, gentlemen. I know we have Captain Hallisey's here as well this evening. Good evening, Captain. Any questions, counselors? <laughs> Councillor Rodriguez. Uh, my question is, this is a, uh, a, a small grant for a, uh, a, sum, a summer in peer driver Yes. The summer's almost all gone. Have you guys used these funds, or this is for no, uh, uh, use? I can tell you what happened. This is actually um, additional funds of the traffic enforcement grant that we received in January. At the time, we received fifteen thousand dollars, and if we met certain benchmarks, we knew we would receive another five thousand dollars. Unfortunately, the state, when they award these funds, they don't take into account that cities have their own ways of, of making sure that expenditure is following procedures. So, the, and these particular, this particular grant follows national campaigns. The national campaign for the summer drive sober, sober or get pulled over is between August 20th and September 8th today. So, um, when I put this, when I made this filing in late, in, in late July, mm -hmm. I asked for rules to be suspended at council. That was not possible. So um, that meant that I, and to be honest, I didn't realize that it hadn't gone through. So we waited until August 27th to run any shifts. We did run shifts. I've held on to the cards. So if council will allow, we will put those through along with the reporting. Otherwise, we'll have to find another way to pay for those shifts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilors, Councilor Fawa. Well, I, I would move uh, to amend this order to read that the Council accepts a grant in the amount of $5,000 and authorizes the expenditure for the uh, FY 2020 Traffic Enforcement Grant Summer Impaired Driving. Second. A motion has been made to, am uh, to amend and properly seconded. All those fav in favor of the amendment, all those opposed, the amendment carries. The motion is, um, I'm sorry, the, um, right now we're voting on the order as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? The order carries favorably back to the full city council as amended. Madam Clerk, number eight. Ordered total transfer of $164,376.18 from Executive Office of Health and Human Services, fiscal year 21, safe and successful youth to Brockton Police Department, fiscal year 21, safe and successful youth initiative grant fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel Gomes, Chief of Police. Any questions, counselors, for Mr. Clarkson or the Chief? Councilor Nicastro. I have no questions, but I am familiar with this program, and I just want to say it's a true program from which Brockton really benefits, and I support this greatly. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Powell, you have an amendment? Yes, I would uh, move to amend this order that the council accepts a grant in the amount of $164,376.18 and authorizes expenditure for the FY21 Safe and Successful Youth Initiative Grant to the Police Department. Second. Second. Motion has been made to amend this order and properly seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? 
All those opposed, the amendment carries. Uh, the question now is on the order as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed, the order goes back favorably as amended to the, um, goes back favorably to the full city council as amended. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number, number nine. Ordered transfer of $600,000 from Federal Emergency Agency, FEMA, fiscal year 2019, assistance to firefighters grant for $545,454.55 to Fire Department, fiscal year 2019, assistance to firefighters grant fund. The required 10%, $54,545.45, matched to be appropriated from Fire Department Ambulance Receipts to Fire Department Capital Projects. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Williams, Chief of Fire. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Do you had just take questions or do you have anything to state yeah, on so this front? Just to give you a heads up, so this money was uh, applied for to replace our tactical support unit, which is a supplemental vehicle that runs with Squad A at my central station on Pleasant Street. Um, Squad A has to um, operate as an engine, carrying water and hose like all the other trucks do, because it protects the downtown area. But that company is also responsible for all the heavy rescue in the city, um, bad motor vehicle accidents, trench rescue, um, confined space rescue. There's a lot more equipment that needs to be carried for those um, endeavors than can be carried on that single fire engine. So in 1999, Chief Galligan purchased a almost like a box truck, and its title is the Tactical Support Unit. We call it the TSU. So this grant is to replace that TSU. Any questions, councilors? Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, as with the previous orders, I move that the, to amend the order so that it states that the council accepts the grant in the amount of $600,000 and allow the, its, its expenditure of the said grant. Second. A motion has been made to amend the order and properly seconded. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed, the amendment carries. Um, question is on the order as amended. All those in favor? All those opposed, the order carries favorably back to the full city council as amended. Thank you, Thank Chief. you, Councilor. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number 10. Ordered that the city of Brockton opt into the PACE Massachusetts program. The PACE program is an economic development tool for cities and towns across the Commonwealth that focuses on financing energy improvements in commercial buildings. Invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Robert May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. So Mr. May was not able to be with us uh, this evening, but um, I know Mr. Clarkson, you'll. Yes, Madam Chairman, I know you've had the opportunity to, uh, to have some information and a presentation on this. I did, uh, again, yesterday forward you the, the, the PowerPoint that Mass Development had provided. So I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, I think, from the city's perspective, certainly from a financial perspective. Our role is really uh, to support and facilitate uh, the, the program. And so it, it uses uh, private funds, but we facilitate the, the leaning of the property and ensure the collection uh, of, uh, of, of the money that's appropriated. And I would su suggest that the city benefits through these sorts of improvements and it's just one more tool in the toolbox to facilitate economic development uh, or as Mr. May would say, perhaps one more layer in his seven layer dip. So happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions for Councilor Nicastro? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Clarkson. Um, it's a very interesting program. I'm wondering, as I understand it, um, this, the uh, mass development lends the money and then it goes on as in the form of a betterment lien onto the properties, um, the home or the property owners, commercial property owners, um, they pay as, as part of their tax bill, a portion of the funds that they're debited goes toward this. My question is, what if they don't pay? Well, there is, so there is a lien uh, on the property and 
so in that lien, uh, I would point you to page, if you have the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, on, on page 14, it notes that municipal liens are senior to PACE liens, but unpaid PACE assessments are senior to all other private mortgage liens in a foreclosure. So, uh, so th there is, uh, I think, significant security uh, with the placement uh, of, uh, of these liens and uh, they are secured by the property. Yes, but do you foresee that mass development, whoever the current holder is, will they have to foreclose the lien? I mean, I mean I, how, how would they get paid if the property owner stops paying? And that happens a lot in this community. Yeah, I, well, certainly that is an option uh, that, that would have to occur. Uh, the, the city's interest, uh, or I I any interest that the city had in the property for anything unpaid would be senior to that. So uh, I, I suppose it's certainly possible, uh, but we would hope that given what we're seeing in terms of economic development uh, these days, despite the, the, the challenging economic conditions, uh, we're still seeing significant improvements and redevelopment in the downtown area. So while it's possible, I, I, I would hope that it would be uh, un unlikely. Okay, and I understand that our real estate tax lien would be superior to this lien. Right. And this lien is superior to a mortgage or anything else. Correct. Um, but what if they don't pay it? I, I mean, is it possible that mass development or the current holder of the lien under this program could come after the city and say, you should pay it? That's what I'm wondering. What, what is our obligation on this? What's a downside? Well, I don't see a downside to answer the second question first, and I don't believe uh, that uh, that mass development would be in a position to either suggest or require the city to, to pay. So there really is, from what I understand of the program, and I joined the mayor and Mr. May in a pretty extensive presentation from mass development on this uh, some weeks ago, that, that really, from a financial perspective, uh, there is little or no downside to the city because I don't foresee any liability on our part. Okay. I could see a mortgage lender including a provision in their mortgage saying that they, they have the obligation to advance the funds and therefore the, the borrower would have to pay them. I would just like to make sure of that before we vote on this in council next week. Sure. Uh, then, I, I don't want to see any obligation for us. So I, I will reach out after this meeting to the representative from uh, Mass Development mm -hmm. and try to get that answer so that I can provide it to all the councils in writing before your next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Any other question, Councilor Fawa? It's just for the record, colleagues, I had a conversation with the Chairman of the Board of Assessors. Mr. O'Donnell checked with some of his counterparts and other communities where this program has been highly successful. It does, as Councilor Nicastro mentioned, require some additional sign-offs. For example, the, the, uh, it has to be an agreement with the lending company to escrow the money for any betterment. Uh, my only concern, and it may not be a concern, but I'm just not sure, is are we changing the work done by the union employees in the assessor's office because they are now going to be responsible for entering data, tracking payments, and ensuring that the betterments uh, are, are being followed. So I, I have no problem with this program, but I would feel a little better if we had a letter from the law department say, stating that they don't see any collective bargaining problems that might arise if we adopt this program, which really is separate and apart from collecting uh, t property taxes from our commercial and residential property owners. That's my only concern. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? You know, I, I, Madam Chair, I'd really, I think I'd like to make a motion to postpone this until our next finance committee meeting because I'd like to see that letter and I'd like to get the information on, on uh, what our obligation is. I'll second that. Motion has been made and properly seconded to postpone to the next finance meeting, um, which is 
Well, it's got a date. 21st, I believe. Sorry, when is it? First. I believe it's the 21st. 21st, okay. Yep. So a motion has been made and properly seconded to postpone to the next uh, finance meeting, which is September 21st. All those in favor? All those opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. The matter is postponed to the next finance meeting. Thank you, counselors. Uh, Madam Clerk, number 11. Ordered that the City Council of the City of Brockton finds that there is a clear need for an or urban renewal plan. In order to achieve the approved objectives on Brockton Comprehensive Plan, a blueprint for Brockton that the downtown Trout Brook Urban Revitalization Plan, as described in Exhibit A, prepared by Harriman and RKG Associates, dated June 2020, is an urban renewal plan prepared in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 121B and 760 CMR 12.00, that the City Council approves that the boundaries of the downtown Trout Brook Urban Revitalization Plan, plan located in City Clerk's Office for review, invited Honorable Mayor Robert Sullivan, Robert Jenkins, Executive Director of Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Good evening, Mr. Jenkins, and we have a special guest with us this evening as well. Hi, good evening, Emily. counselors. Uh, it's good to see everyone here this morning, this evening. Um, as you know, our, we have a urban revitalization plan, an opportunity to actually plan for um, what I consider for the city um, housing, economic development, employment, um, in a certain area of the city that a plan calls for 20 years. I think we're gonna go through a presentation with Emily Enos from Harriman and RK, RKG Associates. Um, the one thing I'd like to do when I've talked to the counselor is we'd like to keep this open for a couple of reasons. One, because of COVID and the fact that it's slowed down a little bit of our process. But two, this is the first time many of you are actually seeing this presentation. I think it's a it's it's upon the BRA and US counselors in your approval process to make sure that we have a a vetted public process in order to get input. This is really an opportunity for you as leaders and for the BRA and the mayor to actually come up with a strategy and a methodology for an urban revitalization plan. Similar to what we did with the downtown um, I think it was mentioned earlier, there is a lot of development going on downtown. Once again, it's a 20-year plan. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I don't think any of us can kind of predict what's going to happen in the next two, three, four, or ten years down the road. But this is an opportunity that most municipalities don't take advantage of and actually plan for what components can make the city better. We have a... Um, the one thing that I'm concerned whenever I look at a lot of these urban revitalization plan, housing is my is kind of my specialty. But Brockton leads Plymouth County in unemployment. We also have a large minority business that needs what I would call a lot of technical assistance. In this plan, you'll see that there is something called commercial flex. How do you define commercial flex? It's a new term for me as well. Emily is going to take us through that. And like I said, this is an opportunity for us to kind of plan for a future for the next 20 years. I don't know if I'll be here. God willing, I'll still be around, but may not be here. But it gives us an opportunity to plan for the future for the city of Brockton. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. I'm here to answer any questions. Um, like I said, this is the first for a lot of you, this is the first time you're going to even see this presentation. I know we've held maybe one or two public meetings, Emily, um, and people participated. But because of COVID, because of, you know, just a slowdown, um, I think it's in our best interest to at least hold. I think we have scheduled on the agenda one public meeting, but I think we need to have two prior to you even going through your process, okay? So at this point in time, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for clarifying that, um, Mr. Jenkins. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Council. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I hope you can hear me through the mask. Thank you. 
we appreciate you being here as well. I know it's a lot of um, companies aren't bringing in live representation. So thank you for being here. We appreciate it. It is actually my first in-person meeting since March. So. <laughs> Um, my name is Emily Innes. I'm Director of Planning for Harriman, and I've been the project manager on this project. Uh, we worked, it's actually a two-phase project. The first phase was the CSX Area Plan. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I actually won an award on behalf of the city last year from uh, APA Massachusetts. This is the second phase, is to turn the work that we did for that plan into an urban renewal plan under the state legislation. So. I'm going to walk you through the qualifications of the urban renewal area and how this, this particular area qualifies, talk to you a little bit about the components of the CSX area plan, the plan objectives of this urban renewal plan, um, give you a taste of the financial plan and what it means. I know you're going to want to spend a lot more time with the plan itself, so this is really an introduction. Um, and then talk to you a little bit about the approval process, where we are, and some about the implementation for the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. So this is the boundary. Um, I hope you can see it fairly well. Uh, you'll see it's Elliott Street at the top, Court Street towards the um, bottom. On the uh, left-hand side is the rail line and the downtown. Um, and on the east uh, side, we start to go into um, the neighborhood areas. And this is really important to us. Um, as we looked through the CSX area plan, the idea of both housing and jobs was critical. This is currently an industrial area now. We didn't want to turn it over to all housing because its location next to the downtown and the next to the rail station made it a really important area for increase in economic activity in the city of Brockton. However, we didn't want to keep it all industrial because you have these established neighborhoods. So Trout Brook really became the dividing line between the two of them. And we'll talk about that in uh, more detail as we go through uh, the actual plan objectives. But first for the eligibility, an urban renewal area under Massachusetts state law needs to be an area that really is not going to be revitalized without public action. In other words, the private market hasn't been able to do it on their own. This is very different in many ways, although the legislation has been tweaked a little bit since the 1950s and 1960s, how we apply it now is very different from how it was originally applied. And how it was originally was applied, I'm sure many of you know, was a top-down process where the federal money came in, people cleared out whole neighborhoods and areas, and then often things didn't actually happen there to the detriment of the neighborhoods that were cleared out and to the communities as time progressed. Now it's really much more of a targeted approach, a bottom-up approach that requires public um, engagement and understanding of what's going to happen and input into what's going to happen. And so we held some community meetings at the time. We have since held other meetings. We will continue to hold uh, meetings as we discussed earlier. Uh, to make sure that people understand what is uh, proposed for this area and to get the input. So in terms of why the private market hasn't been able to work here, that's where we start to look at what the eligibility is. So in this case, the CSX parcel has been vacant since the 1980s. So clearly the private market has not worked to change it since then. There are hazardous materials, which tends to be difficult for the private market to deal with on its own because of the cost. You have a regulatory floodway and existing damage from repeat flooding for Trout Brook. And it's interesting, I was looking into the plan uh, earlier today, refreshing my memory on a few things, and I have an old picture in there. Um, we found when we were uh, working on the plan, calling out in a, a, a red boundary where the existing area is, but it's an old picture of Brockton done in the 1800s, and it shows a much longer, wider trout brook and ponding, uh, actual ponds that it flowed into that aren't there today, it's developed. And so you can see that that water is going somewhere. In many cases, it's going into other buildings. This parcel itself, the CSX parcel and some of the parcels around it, um, it the CSX parcel is very large, it's irregular. It is hard for the private market to develop because of the way it would have to be broken up into uh, more than one ownership. And 
As an industrial area, there's limited access by rail and by trucks that would be needed to supply your typical industrial. And this is where the idea of commercial flat systems come in. So these are just some maps. I'll flip through them fairly quickly that show you each of those points. So you can see the CSX parcel in bright yellow there. That is the largest parcel. You know, the irregularity of the shape and how it's stretching from the rail on the left to the neighborhoods on the right. So that's a, that's a large hunk of land next to your downtown to have been vacant since the 1980s. The hazardous materials, you see that there's an AUL on the um, uh, CSX parcel that's an area use limitation. It means that certain uses can't happen there until the environmental conditions are mitigated to an appropriate level for those uses. Um, and then there's a smaller one where there's uh, additional restrictions on that. This shows the regulatory floodway around Trout Brook. And this shows, again, the size and the irregular shape of the parcel for CSX. And this shows the limited access. So Elliott and Court Street each have a bridge that the rail crosses over the streets on. Those are historic bridges. They're too low for 18-wheelers, which means if you're going to have significant industrial use in your industrial area, those 18-wheelers are going to have to come from another route, and they're going to have to go through the neighborhoods to get there. So the idea of changing this to a higher industrial um, becomes a problem for those neighborhoods. The other thing is, and this is the work that my colleagues at RKG Associates did, was to look at your other industrial areas. This doesn't have the highway access that many industrial areas are looking for. It's just that much further away. And so that makes it more difficult to uh, develop for those uses. So another thing to look at in eligibility is, again, back to the private market, what they, can they do? And so this was the work that RKG Associates did, looking at the limitations of the private market in the area. So at the time we did this last year, your multifamily residential market was showing momentum but the depth of the demand was still unclear. We know housing is an issue, but how it's an issue becomes a question for us. Industrial red, I mentioned near the, uh, they're strongest near the highways and the demand for industrial further from the highways also unclear. The city through its redevelopment authority has the ability to assemble parcels that the private market cannot do. And um, project returns that would attract developers are difficult. Uh, because of the cost of development in the area. Every city in Massachusetts pays Boston prices for construction and labor, but they can't get Boston rents. And that makes it difficult to develop housing in non-Boston markets because of that disparity. And then the proposed commercial flex use often requires subsidies or other creative financing options. If you look at the CSX area master plan, we have, and it was brought forward into this redevelopment plan, we have a thorough analysis from RKG Associates in our appendices of um, the subsidies that might be required for different uses. Single family homes might be able to attract investment without subsidies, but again, we have the area use limitation and we didn't want to lose the entire area to housing when jobs are a critical need for the city. Rental units do have a financing gap. They also have a fire, fire, higher risk and a longer absorption period, which is the number of units that can come online in any one year. So from the CSX area plan, we came up with a total development volume. I'm going to break this map down to you in smaller pieces, but essentially on the, as you, as you face the area, you're looking on the left-hand side is where the industrial uses are proposed, the commercial flex. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the housing, and this is of, of Trout Brook, single family housing on parcel sizes that are consistent with the existing neighborhood. We're extending some of the streets on that side so that the neighborhoods now kind of become integrated in terms of their street layout and their ability to walk from homes to downtown along existing roads. On the left hand side, along with the commercial flex, we're proposing some retail office ground floor right along Court Street a little bit uh, potentially of multifamily. Now, how this gets developed out over time will depend in part on the market and the actions that the BRA takes. But this acts as a conceptual framework to identify the zoning, to identify the level of development that could be available, 
and to um, set up the urban renewal plan for the volumes that you would like to see as a city, as a community going forward. We mentioned commercial flex a couple of times. It's a good time to define it. So this is a mix of industrial office, sometimes retail space, that can be easily rearranged to meet the needs of the business without permitting, additional permitting or licensing. So if you're a manufacturer, you're in commercial flex, you can have space for your manufacturing and your warehousing and the office needs and a retail space. And if you need to change the percentage of each, you're not having to come back for a new special permit. That makes it a lot more flexible, a lot easier for businesses to come in. In some communities, those uses are so rigidly defined that you would have to come back every time you needed to shift a little space from manufacturing to office, to retail, and vice versa. So the plan objectives for the redevelopment plan are really built on that CSX area plan. So developing a major underutilized site adjacent to the downtown, walking distance to the multimodal public transit because you've got the bus and the rail there, and separating, and this current area is separating existing neighborhoods from the downtown. So it's not a good walk for people because they're having to pass by this underutilized area. Mitigating existing environmental contamination, which would be cleaned up to the appropriate use level. Um, adding this mix of flex uses and residential uses to support jobs and market rate housing. Then the key part of this becomes back to Trout Brook, which doesn't act just as a divider. Oh, we're gonna put this stuff on the left and this stuff on the right. Trout Brook, Brook becomes a central pathway to link Puffer Playground and Snow Park from the north and the south all the way along Trout Brook with a pathway on the residential side. We've proposed a conceptual idea of a neighborhood playground that would support the existing and future neighborhoods. And suddenly Trout, Path and Trout Brook, instead of being a floodway and a liability and something that is causing problems, becomes a major asset for this area. And then finally, expanding that open space along the regulatory floodway and removing invasive species from Trout Brook and the buffer along it. So you can see this in the map, just zooming in. Um, here's the commercial area. So tucked in the back, significant buffer around the residential area to the north. You can see the open space that acts as flood storage around Trout Brook to the right. And then um, this mix of the commercial flex in the back. And then as you get closer to the street, Port Street, you see the multifamily housing and the retail and office uses, creating an active street environment there. And this up, there we go. Um, so that's just calling out the key components. And I'll have a revised version to this uh, to Mr. May tomorrow so that he can distribute it to you. Um, we'd also looked at that area, by the way, as a potential location for a public safety building, which had been something that was discussed during our conversations during this plan. This really zeroes in on the walkway connecting Puffer Playground to Snow Park, expanding that open space to act as flood storage and removing the invasive species. Sorry, right, this clicker isn't mine. Oh, there we go. Um, so that just calls out the components that we've already discussed. But I want to note that the connections that would be created with the new roads really strengthen the neighborhoods that are there now by connecting them to more than one. You don't have any of the dead end streets. They get connected to a throughway. And the stormwater management and flood storage is critical for those areas that have been damaged by that. There is a financial plan required by DHCD in the uh, document. I will let you um, take some time to look through it. You may have some questions at a later meeting. But just to let you know that it identifies the cost of the anticipated actions for the BRA, um, the proposed acquisitions uh, and infrastructure improvements, including the Trout Brook Path. It also identifies sources of revenue to offset the costs, which may be grants, loans, which would be repaid in part by a DIF, a district improvement financing, bonds, and the reparcelization sale of any acquired land. Um, you should note that the financial plan is an estimate because this is a 20-year plan. We can't estimate now what it might cost for the entire period. Um, so it is subject to change uh, based on what's happening, but it gives an idea of what the possibilities are, what the grants and loans and other sources are. Where we are today, so last 
fall, we had a public meeting sponsored by the BRA. Um, the BRA also determined necessity, and uh, which is a statutory requirement that they need to do. Planning board determined that it was in conformance with the master plan, and there's a section in there, and that also is a statutory requirement. The final statutory requirement is city council approval. So that's the local level approval, and the city council must hold a public hearing. There's some other requirements around that. Once that's done, assuming that the city council approves it to go forward, um, then it goes to the Department of Housing and Community Development at the state level for state approval. We also file an environmental notification form with NEPA um, because as an urban renewal plan, it is statutorily required to file one of those. Uh, once DHCD approves it, then uh, it becomes actionable. It's, a, it's approved plan, the BRA can take action underneath it. And then just quickly, the BRA's role in approval is the determination, the necessity, planning boards. This is just calling out the four main objectives from a blueprint for Brockton and the com comparable objectives from the redevelopment plan. Your own uh, role in that approval process, DHCD's um, approval, and then the key piece is the implementation here. So the BRA may acquire land to assist the private developers in assembling multiple parcels. Um, they may relocate incompatible uses from other areas of the city. So industrial uses that might be non-conforming in one area, this would give them a place to land within and stay within Brockton and keep those jobs in Brockton. Uh, the VRA would support the zoning changes that the city would enact to allow the recommended uses. And then finally support the creation of design guidelines. We have identified certain design principles for the buildings that would go in place, but those would need to be translated into design guidelines that would be part of your zoning regulations. And that is the overall presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to remind everybody, as Mr. Jenkins stated at the beginning of the presentation, we're just starting the conversation. There's a long way ahead, but um, we're going to take the right steps, have public hearings. Um, counselors, do you have questions for Emily or Mr. Jenkins? Uh, Councilor Cardoso. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, it's not really a question. I just, I'm sitting here and you did an awesome presentation but all of this can get confusing and complicated um, for residents. I'm just asking that when we get to that point that we have like some clear, you know, um, literature or whatever out there for the public, for the residents, so they understand what's going on. Because what happens is we go through all of these, everything ends up in the council, then we have all these upset residents. Um, and, you know, if we start right now, we're in this phase, talking to people and describing what we're doing and marketing it, I think it would just help us to get these. Um, <laughs> Yes, please. Um, and it, it helps when you have a public meeting. Mm -hmm. People understand this is a very difficult thing. We went through it before. But that, that very Mr. Jenkins, can I just have you, what, can you just wipe down the podium? Just so everybody at home can hear you with the microphone, that would be. Thank you. Thank you. We went through this process once before for downtown. This is a very. <laughs> bureaucratic process. Unfortunately, in order for your approval, the state's approval, this is how it, how it is. But back to, to uh, Councilor Cardoso, Cardoso's point, I believe in keeping it simple, mm -hmm. especially when we're meeting with residents and they really don't understand the bureaucratic process. So understanding what it is we're focused on, what you're focused on, because once again, this is just a framework. Um, I was talking to Councilor Wint, uh, Farwell earlier today it's already changed. CSX initially wanted $2 million for the site. Now they say they want $7 million for the site. This is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, we just have to make sure we have a framework that we agree with so that we don't have to settle. That's the biggest thing with a lot of municipalities. They end up settling because they don't have a plan. They don't have the framework. And so this provides us with a framework, with a plan. And as we roll out the plan to just, you know, make sure that we're um, putting 
putting it out there for the public, little bits and pieces, mm -hmm. um, leading up to the, the project and not waiting till the end when we have some concrete plans in place to then put it out there. And um, people think that we, in, we just right. all of a sudden went through a process and they had no idea what was right. going on. Because we're seeing it. that a lot, and so it would really help if you did that. But thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you, Councillor. Councillor Fowler. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I did have an opportunity to uh, talk with Mr. Jenkins today, and I, I've spent considerable time on this going through the plan page by page, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, although I know most of you understand I get involved in these issues and it's hard. The, the scope and scale of this project, and, and by the way, the report was exceptional. The scope and scale of this project is what concerns me, and I, I've taken a very cautionary approach to it. In 2010, our law department refused to allow CSX to enter onto this property to clean it up because they were so concerned that trucks would be exiting on city streets. And, and might provide contamination. I, I do understand that there has been some mitigation on the CSX property in terms of environmental concerns, but I'm not sure how extensive that is. And now we find out that a 30-acre parcel, which is almost, I would say, the foundation on which this plan would be built, is now escalating in price. I would, I would suspect that if we were to, pr to approve this, or forward it along, at this point they would raise the, the value of the property even more. There are, according to the documents, there are 48 parcels that are owned by 27 different entities. The City of Brockton owns eight, and 40 others are owned by various individuals, and that's, on, that's in Table 6 of the report. There are 28 acquisitions, and you'll, meaning properties that we might have to acquire for this to go forward, and that's in Table 10. There are nine relocations of either people or businesses. One of them happens to be the French Club, which uh, is frequented by a lot of people that we probably all know. That is one of the businesses that is listed as a potential acquisition. And that, by the way, just to digress a minute, that's one of the problems when these reports come out. People now wonder, oh my lord, are they going to come in and take my property? What am I going to get for it? Where am I going to go? So it kind of raises the fear factor, if you will. Um, the financial plan is on table 14. Overall, it's a $22.1 million plan in today's dollars. $9.29 million would be uh, gain through either loans or bonds. So there was a book written in 1999 called Better Not Bigger. And, and I'm kind of asking all of you to think about, maybe it's a rallying cry, that we've got to make Brockton better, not bigger. Now that doesn't mean we don't go forward with the housing projects that we have on the board now. I think they're very meritorious. I think they will do very well. Um, Mr. Jenkins and the BRA are involved in those. Uh, Mr. May is. The city is involved in that. But I'm convinced that we need to reorient our thinking to better, not bigger. Now what do I mean by that? Well, separate and apart from economic development, my big thing is fight the virus and get the kids back to school. I, I think if I had one priority and I could wave a magic wand, it would be to get the virus to a point where we can get kids back in school where they belong. But there are so many other things that I think we could do as a city because we have businesses, minority businesses, recently formed businesses that are going to go under. Are they in danger of going under? We have residents who are on, un on unemployment and that unemployment is going to run out, and I'm not convinced they have jobs to go back to because of the, the virus. I'm not convinced that the state will have the revenue in the immediate future to fund some of the grant programs on which we rely so heavily. But it seems to me that we as a council, as we're privileged to sit here and try to chart a course for the city. It seems to me that we ought to work with the BRA at this point, work with Mr. May, do a needs assessment survey to find out what are the short-term and long-term effects of the virus on our businesses. Are they going to make it? If they're not going to make it, is there anything we can do? I don't know. 
Is there economic development potential in our current empty Brockton buildings? Councilor Fowler, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, I, I mean, is this related directly to the presentation? It's, it's, it, it's, I would it, like to keep it with this. I mean, it, I. If it, it is I related to going, the. But it is related to the issue of whether we embrace this, which is before us or whether we consider other options. That's what I'm trying Back, to go But as through. Mr. Jenkins stated at the start of this, this is just the start of the conversation. There is nothing final here tonight, and it won't be final next week or even next month. This is just the start of a conversation to open up hearings, to listen to the public, to listen to the counselors. To This isn't end all. I mean, this isn't, this is just the start. So I, I see your point, what you're saying, and I, I know it's uncertain times, but I believe right this evening before us is this order regarding, um, you know, opening up the conversation about this CSX uh, property. And, and that is where I'm going, uh, Madam Chair, as okay. to why I think that this should be postponed a minimum of a year or 18 months because of the financial conditions of the people in this city that need immediate help because of the financial conditions of the state and because there are so many other <clears throat> priorities that we should establish. And I, I'm not necessarily mentioning this for all of you here. You know, I love all of you, but it's the people out there who elect us. I want them to know that people sit here and they're somewhat thoughtful about what we do, somewhat thoughtful about our decisions. So if you wish me to, to uh, wrap up, I'm going to quote my colleague, Councilor Rodriguez, from about two and a half years ago, and he said something that not only was profound, but we haven't followed it yet. And you were sitting, I think, at the, uh, the War Memorial Building, and you said, let's do something, and let's follow through with it. Let's see it to its completion. So we have a public safety facilities study going on. We've got school needs, and colleagues, this should wait. This should wait. This Trout Book plan, as meritorious as it could be if scaled back, should wait. And I would ask you to just consider the other priorities that I think we could embrace to help the people and the businesses that we have here now who are struggling. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ian Airy. <clears throat> thank you, um, thank you, M Madam President. And I want to thank you for the presentation that you've made here uh, this evening in regards to this uh, this uh, large, humongous piece of property that I, I think we've been wrestling with for uh, a good couple of years. Um, and I and I do have to agree with my colleague at large, um, Councilor Fowell, and, and what he's indicated here this evening. I, I realize that you know at some point we, we need to move forward with it. Um, I would look at it the same way that he's looking at it. It is something that either we postpone it or we just accept it and place the report on file. And the the next, and I would say the next time that we want to start to rediscuss, then the council of that ward would bring it back and we'd start some rediscussion. Um, I, I, I totally agree with what what um, what uh, Council Fowler has said, and, and having been involved in the political arena here for so many years, um, I foresee ourselves at this particular time, if this particular game that we're we're having here with this particular virus and what direction we're going, um, we've got a long, long way to go. Brockton's got an awful long way to go with finances. Um, I'm getting very, very concerned with, with what I see and what's going on in the city. Um, we need to sometimes, and this is my own opinion, we need to get on track to get governing a little bit more. I know we, we, we got the virus and, and we have to work that as well, but we've got to keep the car in drive. That's what D means, drive, and not R in reverse. And I find us right now stuck in the middle. And I don't think that's being, uh, being very helpful to the, um, to the people that we serve here in the city. And I understand what, what you're trying to do, and no doubt we do want to do something at some point. But um, I, I just think right now uh, for us to keep, even keep thinking to discuss it and you know, have something you know, wrapped up in a few months, that's not gonna, that's, that's not gonna happen. It's not gonna be something that, that I, w I would be supporting. It's just, um, this is just, just difficult times and uh, shown with what we have, um, have seen. Um, I, I, again, I don't see us coming out of anything anytime too soon. Um, we lost a lot of money that was gonna come into the city this year just for our school system alone. You won't see that money for some time. I don't care who you are in the state house, state representative, state senator, lieutenant governor, no matter what, you're gonna, that money's not gonna come back the way that it should come back. I've seen it, I've been there, done it. Council Fowler knows that when he was a mayor, we, we, know, we know what we went through. I mean, it's, um, it's tough times, unfortunately, because of something like this that's hit us. But um, I, I continue 
to want to discuss it, yes, I really do. I think we should, but I just don't want to see us moving it, you know, fast because we do have some other things on the table that we we are trying to get moving again. Hopefully, we can, and this is in this to make, be a part of it. But I just wanted to let my intentions be known, and I appreciate your report and the time you put into it. It's been a great. It was a great report, and I I, I truly agree, and I agree with the council Cardozo said as well because we need to break it down so that everybody does have an understanding because that becomes very important now. I think you've seen it in a lot of other projects in this city. 30 or 40 people come out and start talking about something. Project's gone. Gone. Traffic. Something. It's gone. You know what I mean? And that hurts us. And I'm sure this would definitely be definitely be an issue where, you know, the people have to be, definitely have to be a part of. So, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to say, I do agree with, uh, you know, uh, what Councillor at Large Farwell had said and quoted Councillor at Large Rodriguez in terms of uh, we need to make sure that we follow through. Uh, we do have a lot of things in the air. We have a lot of uh, plans going. Um, but I think it's important to note that those plans don't always fall on, on the same heads. You know, they, they're given to uh, multiple people whose full-time job it is to follow these through. Uh, I think we do need. I think we do need better follow through. Um, you know, for things like the facilities. Uh, you know, master plan. I'm. I'm not saying that it's nothing's going on with it, but that's that's a plan that I was very interested in. We we haven't heard anything about it lately. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure it's still in operation, but you know, it's just an example I'm I'm giving. Um, Massachusetts at least Massachusetts, Rhode Island, our immediate area, uh, you know, everything south of Boston and, and yeah, going into Rhode Island as well, uh, we're all going to come out of COVID. We're going to emerge on the other side. And we are going to see, uh, you know, some, it's, it's not, we're, we're not going to come out of it the same way we came in. You know, we're, we're going to be forever changed by this, uh, for better or worse, and trust me, there will be some worse. Uh, but we'll, we'll all lose, uh, you know, businesses. We will have high unemployment. But what we do next is what is very important. What we do next is whether or not we remain with lost businesses and high un unemployment. The cities and towns that are most aggressive coming out of COVID on the other side, the, the cities and towns that are responding to their residents' needs faster, uh, addressing code enforcement issues better, and growing and developing uh, business community, housing stock, everything that a, a growing city needs. Whoever comes out of COVID whoever hits the ground running whoever whoever does that first whoever's whoever's best at it is going to position themselves to be the central point of the region the best towns the best cities uh you know that really put their nose to the grindstone now get everything teed up and when when things open back up when when opportunity starts to abound again and it will uh whoever's whoever's best positioned to take advantage of what happens will reap the rewards. Whoever is not prepared, whoever waits until the, you know, whoever waits until the start to do their prep work will be left behind and we will run the danger of being saddled with uh, struggling businesses and higher unemployment for the next 20 years. We've seen that happen to us more often than we'd like. Uh, there's a lot going on right now, and I'm not going to tell anybody anything different. But I think that at the very least, uh, like my colleague in Ward 3 said, let's keep it in drive. We don't have to stomp on the gas, but let's keep the ball rolling because this is, you know, this is the future that we have to deal with. This might not be the literal future, but this conversation is going to lead to what happens to that property. And... I'm ready to keep that conversation going uh, so that, you know, our residents, my residents, 
uh, have the best Brockton they can for as long as they can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nicastro. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and I really enjoyed the presentation, and I'd very much like to obtain a copy of it. Um, I'd like to be able to print it out in color because I think I would benefit much more from actually being able to see it. And I echo what everyone said. I, as, a, as an elected city official, I'm getting so many calls from people who need help in so many different ways. Um, COVID has hit our community hard and we're, we're bracing ourselves hoping that the second wave doesn't hit us quite so hard. But I also know a bit about the private sector and developing in the private sector. And um, I'm, I'm on the front lines of watching another work on this every day and has been from our sofa since the second week in March. And I know that in the private sector, the developers who will come out of this alive and ahead are the ones that continue working, you know, even in a quiet way without, you know, the, the, the lenders aren't returning the calls as fast as you'd like them to, but they still make the calls and they still go forward. And so I am reluctant to say, let's stop this and th until things are better. Because I don't think you're asking us for a commitment or for money or anything like that. I think you're asking to continue planning and perhaps hoping and dreaming. And this just gets us a little, a little closer to that. But I am concerned that this looks a little tone deaf to the people at home who are saying, what are they doing making these plans when so many of us are out of work? Or so many of our small businesses are not going to survive this. And I, I regret that. I don't want that to be. Um, so I guess I'm saying, it like a true lawyer, that I kind of see both sides. Um, I would like to see this continue, but at the same time, with breaks on. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do agree with uh, most of the things that Councilor Farwell actually said in terms of, um, especially the quoting of my quotes back uh, two and a half years ago. <laughs> because uh, frankly, as someone who's been living in the city for quite some time now, I'm kind of tired of all, you know, I think we've had four or five traffic studies done in for the downtown. And I, we're still planning another study. You know, and my hope is that within my lifetime that I'd actually see the fruits of those studies actually take place. But at the same time, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. <clears throat> you know, um, not all of us are focusing on COVID-19. There's a lot of us, you know, more closely associated with agencies and programs that are actually providing relief to the folks in our community. But there are, this is a big city. And there's, a, there's big departments all over the place. And we don't have to restrict the entire city because of the work that I'm doing or the work that you're doing. I think I can do my work and you can do your work. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that, um, as Councilor Nicastro was saying, I think it's important for us not to lose focus of what is going on in terms of COVID, but at the same time, we need to start acting like a city. This is an Avon. Um, I know that a lot of people want to return us back to North Bridgewater, but you know this has been a city of Rockton for quite some time, and I think it's important for us to act like it. And to me, we can do both things. We can take care of the residents of this city with the city with the needs of the falling wall. <laughs> you okay, Councilor? It's an omen. I've been hanging by a thread for years. It just came <laughs> loose. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of my hand was holding that at you. And I believe, as you were saying, that this is just the beginning of this long process. And I don't think it, because uh, Council Fowell, one of the problems that I'd have is that if we basically put the uh, handbrakes on, these people would go back to their office and do nothing and blame it all on COVID. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that at least they have something to do in terms of progressing so that maybe in January, February, when things get a little bit better, we will be a little further along in terms of this process to make sure that it's a process that, you know, as counsel, the, young, the young buck 
sitting on the on the left there were saying that we will be in the uh, in the forefront of things in terms of development because we never know what's going to happen uh, once a vaccine comes on the pipeline and things somehow get back to whatever the normal is. Uh, we need to start and continue to act as a city because I also believe that the uh, the residents of the city that elected us to sit here have elected us to sometimes make the tough choices. And those tough choices means that, yes, we feed people when people need feeding, but at the same time, we make sure that we provide the resources that will continue that feeding as we move forward. So I would actually you know, like us to recommend this favorably to the council in terms of the initial process of what we are beginning to do. Uh, I don't see anywhere in here that it says that you're asking for funding or monies or anything like that on our, you know, from this council to begin with. To me, it was almost like you made a presentation of something that you wanted to continue in terms of dialogue and progress. Uh, I don't see any harm in, in us moving this thing forward knowing that this is just the initial step of probably a hundred other steps to come forward in this sense. So uh, with that, I, uh, if no one else has any. We have uh, councilors that I'll are still waiting. I'll go back. I think, well then thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Rodriguez. Um, before I pass it on to the Ward 5 Councilor where this is located, I just want to add that I agree with Councilor Rodriguez that we, um, we were elected to make tough decisions, and even though we're at tough times, we can't sit here and just not do anything either. Um, and a lot of these big projects that come up aren't just ward projects, they affect the whole city, and we have to keep that in mind that these, these big projects affect everybody, so we have to keep look, look ahead and make sure that we're um, taking care of the future of the city as well. Councilor um, Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. One. <clears throat> um, Ms. Innes, uh, uh, great presentation. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, Robert, uh, you as well. I have to say, uh, this project is the most important development project in Brockton outside of our downtown. Um, this is not something that we've just started tonight. Um, we ha I have been involved in this project since my time on the zoning board. I've attended many public meetings uh, regarding the discussion of uh, the, um, the uh, proposals uh, for this land, uh, including the one earlier this year put forth by MIT. So we've been discussing this project uh, for a long time and I think we need to continue that discussion and not hold it up. Um, I think one thing uh, people need to understand is that this is the beginning of the process for this to be designated, the, the Trout Brook area, to be designated an, urb an urban renewal district. Um, it being designated an urban renewal dis district um, then allows for all of the incentives to attach to this land that would then um, entice developers to come in and uh, begin discussions of development. So um, this today is not just a conversation, but it's the beginning of a process of uh, designating this area an urban renewal district. Um, and that's important. That needs to be done. Um, so that this matter can progress uh, further down. So we can then start talking about development. Um, again, this is a 20-year plan here, just like our uh, downtown action strategy uh, is a 20-year plan. So this is nothing that's going to just come up on us by surprise and uh, all of a sudden uh, uh, buildings are being erected and we don't know what's going on. Um, so it's important that we move this process forward. Our city has a very unique uh, uh, opportunity to uh, develop this wild land from the bottom up. Um, it's also uh, unique to include new zoning uses like the commercial flex use that would provide us some flexibility to adjust to the different market forces that we will find ourselves with at the end of COVID. Um, and so, uh, as uh, Councillor Lally said, it's the cities that are best positioned 
when COVID passes to then pick up the pieces um, and, and move forward. And so by adding uh, new types of zoning like the commercial flex, I think puts us in a position to do just that. Um, additionally, uh, this would also create that uh, river walk along Trout Brook, a uh, community space uh, that I believe our community has been uh, crying out for, another green space along a river where we can have, um, after COVID subsides, where we can have some community functions, uh, some festi uh, festivities uh, along a beautiful uh, nature area, something our city uh, doesn't have outside of uh, DW Park. So, um, and uh, to your point, uh, Councillor Cardoso, we do understand um, there has to be a lot of community involvement here. Um, I will make it my mission to make sure that the, uh, that the residents of this area and uh, of the city at large are fully informed every step of the way uh, on how this project is developed, uh, including their feedback. And uh, I believe there are two more public meetings that are going to be held, uh, one in October, one at the beginning of November, uh, which are part of the requirements um, so that this matter can then come before the City Council for an approval that this become an a urban renewal district. Then it goes up to the state so the state can do their approval process. And then once they approve it, those incentives are attached to this land. Um, I'm excited. I'm, a, I'm extremely excited about the development of this land. I think this is, um, you know, th this is something that can really be a centerpiece of Brockton because we get to decide how it f unfolds from the ground up. And so, um, as Councillor Rodriguez says, I believe we can chew gum and uh, walk at the same time. And so I'm asking that uh, we do move forward uh, with approving uh, approving this matter today. So what I'm gonna ask is since there, uh, we do understand that there are two more public meetings, um, I want us as a city council to have another opportunity to ask questions. Um, as you said, Councillor uh, uh, Nicastro, you're gonna take some time to, to read this, go through it. Mm -hmm. I hope all the councillors uh, take some additional time. I hope we can all attend the BRA uh, public meeting, that we can all attend the planning board public meeting so we can get more feedback from our residents, more feedback from some of the experts who are gonna hear uh, this project, and then that we can all come back in a forum like this uh, so that if we do develop any additional questions, that we can, um, we can ask those uh, to, to you, Mr. Um, Jenkins, or to you, uh, Mrs. Innes. So um, I will uh, make a motion. Uh, I'm gonna make a motion to postpone this matter to a uh, finance committee meeting uh, at the beginning of the, after November 6th. I, I did not take a look at my uh, calendar. Um, because instead of, I know there was discussion of uh, making this, uh, recommending it favorably from here and having a timeout uh, at the second reading mm -hmm. or at the city council uh, stage. Again, I want for all of us to have one more opportunity in a uh, open setting to ask questions, get some feedback. Um, so that's why I'm gonna ask that this go to another uh, finance committee and not move it forward uh, to a, um, a, a vote in the city council. I'll second that motion if I might. Mm. Okay, just Adam a clarification President. on the date, November, s s so it would be the 16th would be the finance meeting. Yes, so uh, if we could, um, I make a motion to postpone uh, this finance committee uh, agenda item to November 16th. I seconded that. Did you still have something, uh, Councilor Fowell? No, okay, the, a motion's the, been made, Councilor Ian Airy? If I just might on the, uh, on the motion, um, because I, I, I do support what the council from Ward 5 is um, talking in regards to this, uh, in regards to this project, and um, one who lived on the east side, um, grew up on the east side. Once I was left the south side for you know a short time there, and went to the east side. I don't think there's probably anybody here in, in this council chambers other than Council Fowler that would recall probably one of the largest, one of the largest projects that we had one time before on the east side was the um, urban renewal district that took in a big area. Excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Jenkins. 
Okay. Just wasn't implied, the implied thing to do when a council is speaking, though, but Council's. that's okay. Um, you know what I'm saying? In, in any case, in, in any case, what I was trying to point out was, was that was a very big project in itself back then because it took in Plymouth Street, Bay Street, Crescent Street, Summer Street, Grove Street. Council Fowl, I know you were a younger man then at, at that point. I think you were in the city of Brockton. You were just more on the south side, but I grew up down there. Um, but I, I, I tell you, um, even back then, it, uh, it, it took some time to do. So I think we're on the right track in what you're doing. I think what, what you're looking for is the correct way to do it. Um, if anybody can ever give you any, any, any insight of how it all worked, talk to J Attorney Jake Creed because he was the Ward 5 City Council when this all went, went down back in the um, late 60s, early 70s. And it took us a six or seven years before that, that project was, um, was done. That's how you got the project that was built down there right by where the new Plough School is. But that was Salisbury Brook area. Then the Plough School came in later years. But, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's going to take some time. But I think you're on the right track of keeping it moving as well. So that's why I second your, your motion and, and keeping it going. Thank you. Thank you, Councilors. Thank you. I, is this on, I know, is this regarded where motion's been made and properly seconded? Is this I have think to on do the with motion, the motion? Madam, Madam Chair. I'm sorry? On the motion. Okay, Councilor Castro also had her hand up. So, uh, Council Nicastro. Thank you. I'll just be a moment. I just wanted to say that tonight, that in this order, we are being asked to approve the boundaries of the revitalization plan. And I can't see those. I just want you to understand. I, I'm, I can't see those so well from where I'm sitting. And so that's why I want a copy of your PowerPoint. Okay. And I think we're, we're trying to work. I, you're, Comments were well taken, uh, Attorney Thompson. I, I just, we need, I think we need more time on this, but I'll stop speaking. And that's speaking. fine. Council Castro. they also stated that, the, uh, Emily stated she's sending it to Rob May, who will get the yes, PowerPoint yes. to all of us. So yes. there's no problem that. Councilor Rodriguez. Madam Chair, I want to, yep. on my motion, I, I actually would like to uh, have Mr. Jenkins, uh, because one of the questions that I had asked him is whether or not that date on, of November 16th actually works for him. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Arenary, my apologies also. Um, oh, that sorry. date does work because on, we're planning on having two public hearings by October 30th Correct. of this year. So that date does work. That's and why Councilor Thompson, it was strategic, he, that's why he stated that right. date. So are we ready to vote, Councilors? Ready? Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Um, actually, no, we, po we voted on postponing right, until right. November, uh, November um, 16th. So we will see you then. I'll see you then. Thank you, Councilor. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Councilors, any moments of um, personal recognition? Councilor Rodriguez, followed by Councilor uh, Cardoso. Don't we have two more items on President? the agenda? Oh, I'm sorry? Don't we have oh, some more items correct. on the agenda? I thought they were. Come, I, I'm not trying to end the no, meeting no, no, really no, quickly. No, no. Councilor Falwell. Yeah, I, I would move to take items 12 and 13 collectively so that they can be postponed. Second. A motion's been made and properly seconded to postpone items 12 and 13. All those in favor of postponing? To win. All those opposed? 12 and 13 are postponed. And um, the, one of the reasons for that, Council Fowell, is oh, that the, 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 the mayor... reason is that the mayor is unable to be here tonight. He's chairing a school Correct. committee meeting. And I assume they'd be postponed to the 21st. Am I yes. correct? Yes. So Thank we'll you. put them on Thank the you. 21st yeah. agenda. Sorry about that, Councillors. I had it already checked off on my agenda. Any moments of personal recognition? Councilor Cardoso. Can I just uh, congratulate two of our councilors who ran um, great races for Senate, uh, Councilor Rodriguez and our Councilor Jack Lally who ran for state rep, good job. It was tough during COVID for people to run for office, so I commend you guys for, for doing that. So congratulations. Congratulations, Councilor. Backing off of that, uh, Councilor Rodriguez and I both finished in the top two in our respective races. It's so, not bad, congratulations, huh? yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I, this is beginning to sound like a broken record in terms of the census in the uh, city of Brockton. Uh, there is a, basically no logical sense that the city is in the mess that it's in in terms of the participation in the uh, 2020 census in the city. Uh, we are 
one of the worst communities in terms of a city in, uh, when it comes to responding to the 2020 census. And furthermore, we are probably the most needy community in terms of needing the resources that the, the census brings to us. So I'm basically uh, standing here, to, well, sitting here tonight and making a plea to the residents of the city of Brockton uh, to make an appeal on behalf of the children and the elderly in this community. Our community is the way we're going. We are set and probably will be losing millions of dollars within the next uh, 10 years because of the lack of participation in the 2020 census. Lives, I mean, we're, we were just here talking about COVID-19. When you sit down and think about it, one of the reasons why this city gets the funding that it gets from you know, chapter 90 funds, from the, all the chapter funds that come into the city from the federal government, those are related to, directly related to census numbers. And it, it doesn't just affect the city itself, it affects community organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations that go after funding for a variety of things. Uh, because one of the first things that those funders will ask you is what is the population that you're serving? And it's based on census numbers. It's not what I think we have in terms of numbers. It's not what anybody in this body thinks of what we have in numbers. It's what it says in black and white that the US Census thinks that we have here in the city of Brockton. So this is basically an appeal. An appeal, we still have time. This is not the end of this thing. We have time and there's a ton of people at home who are, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't complain that you're home not working because you, the, the uh, places of employment are closed and yet not do the things that we need people to do to help us with this process. I think we gotta, we gotta be able, to, again, the walking and chewing gum at the same time, we gotta do both. You know, the city needs these numbers to come forward we cannot be at 60%, less than 60%, where cities like Lowell, Lawrence, and some of these other communities that are tougher to count are in their 70, 80 percentile. You know, that's just unexcusable. You know, and it, it, I think it basically requires all of us that are sitting at this body, every single person that works in city government, any person that's in public safety, because our public safety personnel depends greatly, greatly on census numbers as well, because that's how those funds come down the pipeline. But we all have to, you know, it's that old military saying, we need all hands on deck to help us in this process. And hopefully within the next couple weeks or so, we'll get the community, the citizens, the residents, anybody to basically help us in this process because lives will depend on this. And these numbers will be with us for the next 10 years. It's not just a, a one and done thing. This is 10 years worth of pain and suffering that we're gonna go through if we don't do what we need to do as a city to help our fellow citizens in this community. So Madam Chair, please let's keep this going in terms of these words on a regular basis from this body, from whatever meetings we go to because it's something that this city is greatly, greatly relying on us to do. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Councillor. And yes, um, that is something we all have to do our part to get everybody aware and uh, ask them if they filled out their census. It's ask your neighbors, your friend, your family members. Um, Councillor Rodriguez, on that flyer, can you give people the phone number and the maybe website that they can uh, reach out if they need more information on where to go to fill out the census? Madam Chair, we have, um, City Hall is open and the Mayor's office is basically committed to doing this census work as needed be. Uh, the number here is 508-580-7123. That's the Mayor's office. We've got community bases, uh, basic, uh, community based organizations all over the place that are willing to help individuals out. I mean, this whole process takes a couple minutes on the computer to get it done. So it's through the uh, www.2020census.gov. Uh, most of our children now actually have access to computers that the school department passed on. So we can use the children in the process to do this together because this is something that needs to get done. And it's in various different languages, so people can't sit here and say, well, I don't quite understand it. It's in, uh, I believe, in Spanish and uh, Haitian Creole and Cape Verdean Creole, as well as English. 
It's a very simple process, but we need everybody to kind of get on board and help us out. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I, I would like the uh, community uh, to know that on September 15th at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be hosting a Zoom community meeting uh, to discuss the development of the Christos property. Um, back in February, uh, we had a meeting over at the Baker School to discuss uh, different uh, development scenarios for the Christos property. Uh, the city has hired the architecture firm Harriman uh, to uh, sketch out five different development scenarios. Um, on September 15th at 6 o'clock p.m., we're going to discuss those scenarios. Uh, we're seeking feedback from the community on those scenarios so that can inform us on, uh, uh, on how to develop that project moving forward. Uh, if anybody wants to review uh, those development scenarios. Uh, they are on the city website, or you can check my uh, um, Facebook page. I do have a link to it, but if you go to the city website, it is on the city planning and development page. Secondly, if you're interested in joining uh, the Zoom meeting, you can find that link on the city website, again, on the city calendar page. So I, um, I ask that uh, all interested residents uh, attend the Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm looking for your feedback, and, um, and I will see you then. Thank you. All set. Well, thank you, counselors. With no further business before us this evening, this meeting is adjourned.